Welcome to this week's lecture in scientific programming and Python. And in this week, we're going to deal with statistical modeling. Um, this is going to be the most um, theory heavy um, lecture of all. However, I don't consider myself an expert in statistics too. Um, so I don't want to explain you concepts I don't quite understand or I don't feel too secure about myself. But instead, I'm going to explain you of how we can work with statistics easily and this is the statistics for ha hackers ac approach as also jake van Plas, for example in this nice talk which i linked also down below explains and that is that we don't see statistics as a rule book where we have these and these kinds of tests and we want to apply this test when these and these conditions are met and this test when these and these conditions are met but instead what we want to do here is we want to have a framework where we have one test basically which in our case here is a linear model a simple linear model and we want to see when and how we can use this and what we can do in python using programming um, to use this one test for our data and that is for example, that we can resample our data because we can well, we can do all kinds of computational approaches. If we can do a while loop or any kind of loop, then we can do statistics because we can resample our data, we can bootstrap our data, we can shuffle our data. And using all these kinds of techniques, we don't need our cookbook of, um, of statistical tests as it's normally done. Um, if you learn statistics in this theory focused way as for example if you learn it at our psychology institute of our uh, university so as hackers we can do nice computational things instead of um, having to find the right test and there are really many approaches um, or really many people who see statistics in this way for example like i said there's this uh, jake van der Plas talk um, where he says, well, if you can do a while loop, you can simulate all kinds of statistics and uh, or for loop, I mean, you can simulate all kinds of statistics and you can um, well, do your statistics yourself computationally. And again, there's many um, people who say, well, there's one test, there is only one test, and that is that we have to model our data and we can model our data computationally and then we can compute our one test statistics and from that we can get not only your p-value but also um, many other values which are statistically um, relevant as for example the explained variance and many other things okay and um, with that as a disclaimer i'm going to jump right in and again let me tell you i only can show you the python side i don't want to um, throw any other opinion uh, onto you except that doing it computationally is the way that certainly works and this is why we're going to do it the way we are. But before I start there's actually one personal note I really want to say and that is that uh, when we looked at the evaluation there were quite a few people that said something along the lines of um, when we asked for the auto grading and you don't even take the time to look at the homework yourself um, I, there's one thing I want to say, and that is that where well, there are around 100 people attending this class, and we are two students ourselves, which are not getting paid that well. <laughs> and we're working, so in the weeks I counted, that were the weeks after I coded the entire auto grading and the entire dashboard and so on, which took hours and hours. I was still working twice as much as I'm getting paid per week. So if you, it's, I don't have the, I, I work twice as much as I'm getting paid already. And um, so it's, I hope you understand that I cannot take the time to look at each of your homework individually and neither can Philip because we're not getting paid remotely is enough for that. So if you 
go to our dean and tell our dean that he should pay us five times as much as he does right now. I'm happy to look at all of your homework individually and make notes to all of your homework. Um, but as long as that's not happening, I hope you're fine with us working uh, twice as much as we're getting paid and not five times as much. Um, that being said, if you think we should look at your homework, we always encourage you to simply write us an email. We answer every single email and every single uh, post in the forum. And if you want us to look at your homework, we're happy to do so. Uh, we just use this mechanism with the auto grading to save time for us because, like I said, we're not getting paid really well. So that's how we thought it would be good. Um, and that just as a note, because it was really bothering me to see this response. So that being said, let's start with the lecture. Um, so, so far we only dealt with uh, organizing, transforming and visualizing our data. And we didn't uh, describe the structure that uh, underlies our data. Uh, so what we want to do here is we want to look beyond the actual samples and make statement about the actual underlying process that generated the data using our sample um, such that this generalizes such that we're able to generalize to unseen samples generated by the same underlying process and that's what we do in statistical modeling so modeling is the attempt to describe data by some structure and some parameters so what we have to do usually in statistics is to make this choice of model where the parameters then are fitted to the data algorithmically. Um, yes, and then there are two main branches of this data-driven modeling, one being machine learning and one being statistical modeling. In machine learning, what we do is we split our data into training and test set, then we fit on the training set and we evaluate the generalization performance on the test set. Um, in statistical modeling, we want to fit on all data. We check the assumptions if our fit is an appropriate fit, and then we interpret the parameters. Um, right now, especially, machine learning is done more, um, but not what we what we are dealing with here, because in machine learning, what your end result is, where you have this kind of model, and you can say after that. Uh, I can fit a model, but I can fit a model. You can fit a model for everything if you have enough parameters, because if you have enough parameters, your model can simply remember every single one of your data points. But this is not what we want to do. We want to ask, we want to answer the question if we observed an effect, and that's a different thing. So machine learning is not the relevant thing because I can fit a model is not if we can fit a model is not the question we want to answer, but rather if we observe an effect. And we have an effect if a certain model, um, which is a pro which is supposed to be appropriate um, for our data, and that's why we have to check these assumptions here, tells us that there is a statistical effect. So for example, if we, uh, want, to, if we want to see if uh, the value of one variable uh, depends on another variable, then what we can check for is if uh, the presence of this one variable changes, for example, the slope of the curve for the other variable. And if it does, then there is probably some effect, and if it doesn't, then there is not. And that's what we're doing. And for that, um, we're going to look at linear models. Um, there are many statistical models beside linear models, of course, and lots of them are implemented in the Python stats models package, which is basically a clone of everything you can do in statistics with R. And while one could do a whole course, a whole course on all these different models, and of course there are courses on all these different models done, we only have this one lecture of our SciPy class, so we only focus on the most simple one, which is linear regression. However, the nice thing is that most of the models in stats models actually follow the same interface. So instead of simply calling stats models dot linear model, we can simply call stats models dot logistic model or whatever. So more complex models have the same interface. And because we are only dealing with the programming side of things, um, we can simply look at the easiest one. 
figure out how to how to interpret that one and then if you want to do more complex models you can simply um, exchange them and another nice thing about linear models is that many statisticians also argue um, that generalized linear models can capture all statistical tendencies and I don't want to talk too much about generalized linear models I just want to give you the intuition here and that is that if you have a linear model um, like this well, if you scale the uh, axes accordingly, the y-axis here accordingly using um, logarithmic scale, then your linear model looks, for example, also like a logistic function. If you're using other functions as link functions for linear models, you can express other things. And that is uh, then a generalized linear model. Uh, so to quote Wikipedia here, a generalized linear model is a flexible generalization of ordinary linear regression that allows for response variables that have error distribution models other than a normal distribution. Um, so the GLM generalizes linear regression by allowing the linear model to be related to the response variable with a link function and by allowing the magnitude of the variance of each measurement to be a function of its predicted value. So generalized linear with generalized linear models, you can, for example, express um, odds uh, with, of um, events happening. So, um, of course, for example, linear relationships with probabilities don't make too much sense because, for example, if you say um, something, some variable makes another variable. So, for example, the um, presence of sun makes it twice as likely for you to go to the beach. Um, then, this expressing this as a linear model doesn't make too much sense because if you have a base likelihood of 75% to go to the beach, then twice as likely would be 150%. And how are you 150% likely to, do, to go to the beach? That doesn't make sense. So instead, you would have to take a logistic model where you use the odds. So four to, there's a 4 to 1 chance instead of a 2 to 1 chance now, instead of uh, raw percentages. And generalized linear models then cover all these situations by allowing for response variables that have arbitrary distributions and for an arbitrary uh, function of the response variable, and then this is the link function to vary linearly with the, with the predicted values, rather than assuming that the response itself must vary linearly. Okay, so we use underlyingly our linear model, and then we have this link function, which makes the linear model nonlinear in our um, function that we want to have, for example, our percentages. But that being said, let's look at the pure linear regression model and in this simply we predict some variable y using our design matrix x plus the parameters times the parameters plus the error and a simple linear model which we're looking at for the entire lecture today um, we assume the errors to be normally distribu distributed with a mean of zero and constant variable variance so, so normally distributed mean of zero constant variance that means that given an x we can say as much as that the y value will be determined by a normal distribution centered at the predicted y hat, which we predict using our design matrix and our parameters better. Okay, so the design matrix basically then contains the predictors. And if we now have our line or function, our linear model, this will give us a y for data points x. So we have a data point x and our linear model should tell us where this y is. However, this model will not tell us for a given x that the value is right here on the line of the function. So if we have this being our linear model, it will not tell that for an x being here, the y will be precisely here. But it will rather say your data comes from a normal distribution that is centered around this point. So given this x, the data point is uh, drawn from a normal distribution, a Gaussian, around this point. Um, so we have a simple function that predicts y values for an x and then puts the y values of the prediction onto uh, a range. Okay, and in the case of the simple linear regression, um, our predictor beta is rather easy and that is that it simply contains the intercept and the slope. So beta is simply 
a and b being the intercept and the slope. And this matrix multiplication now simplifies a lot to that our predicted y for some given um, xi is a plus xi times b plus uh, a plus xy times b plus our error at this position. Okay, so we simply have a linear model with this being the intercept and here the slope of the curve and then an error around um, some kind of Gaussian distributed error around the point that we're predicting. Um, using our um, So the actual y is a bit away from the predicted y and this bit is encoded in the error. Okay, so let's look at how um, this looks in terms of the predicted probability density function, okay? So what um, we're doing here is we're creating this class simple linear model which has um, these parameters, so it has um, the slope, uh, no, the intercept, the slope and um, the uh, width of forever and if we predict what we're doing is where we predict in y hat using our intercept plus x times the slope and then um, we're making a normal distribution with um, the scale as we write here around y and then we want to simply return the probability density function and to plot this prediction um, we're using Seaborn here, a Seaborn heat map where we simply set the x and y tick label smart and then here we are making a linear model here with um, the intercept being one and the slope being one here and we want to look at all the predictions uh, from 0 to 5 so we have x ranging from 0 to 5 we have 100 points for x and for each of these x's we want to make uh, we want to uh, write out or rather plot out the probability density function here and then we're plotting this and if we run this um, well we've seen already it looks like this okay so for a y for an x being for example 3 with this linear model here we have the highest probability that it's somewhere around here but there's also probability that it's around here as we see here in the probability density function so there's an 0.3 something that it's in the center and it gets less likely um, out of the center. And if we change the intercept, um, what we're seeing is that where the curve will simply be a bit more down. Um, so now it's barely even visible. And we can also change the slope, which is simply change um, the steepness of our um, probability density function here. Also make negative slopes. Um, oops. See that more. And now we do. Okay. I'm gonna get one last time back to what happened if we had generalized linear models. Is that changing the intercept would not change the height of the function here, but rather the shape like this, and changing the slope. Well, it would change the slope, but on a logit scale that looks differently. And we can simply make our y scale a logit scale. And if we do this, we observe this here. However, note also that now the um, um, the range here, um, the width of our probability density function changes. And that is that, for example, here for small values of x, and we have a, a high distribution of um, probabilities here. So the probabilities are widespread. And the higher we get, um, the higher our x becomes, the uh, closer, the more dense our probability density function is. So this is a side effect um, of having of changing to the logit scale. But now we can forget all these generalized near model stuff because that's it. We could do more, uh, but with that in mind, let's stick to the simple case of the linear regression for the stack giant. I'm not gonna 
tell you again of how this would look like if we had a generalized linear model because from now on we're dealing only with the standard linear model. One, one last thing, thing I, I forgot, forgot and that, that is that, that um, when plotting, plotting this, this I didn't change the sigma parameter. parameter. Isn't UTF-8 great? great. And, and that is um, that we changed now the intercept and slope and gathered all the predictions for the x values to have this 2D probability density function, but of course we can also change the width. And if we increase sigma, what we're going to see is with now. That's really wide. That the width of our probability density function becomes wider. Or closer. This here is an artifact of us using uh, this link space only 100 points each.